just a little bit about me, first of all, before we begin. Um, my name is Brian Tiemann. I'm one of the co-founders of Joomla. i based in the UK. Um, professionally, I spend my time as a Joomla consultant and Joomla trainer. Um, I have an online uh, Joomla Shack University, which is a video-based training system. Um, most of I've done some work for the government. I've done some work for um, an organization which, when you look at their location on the Google Maps, is a big green field. And when you get there, is a huge industrial complex. Um, I've also done some work uh, for one client. Uh, it's a huge Joomla install. I'm not allowed to say who they are, but they're finger-licking good. Um, and I get to travel the world a lot. Um, I've done 40,000 miles so far this year, and it looks like I'm going to do another 40,000 um, for the rest of the year. Um, all of that on Joomla work, promoting Joomla around the world. Um, but I also get training requests from around the world. Um, last year, I got a, an email request um, that came from the US Army. I did think it was kind of strange that the US Army are going to be emailing a guy in the UK to do training. So I replied back, of course I can do your training requirement. It's about three days' work. Um, I'm assuming that you're on one of the US Army bases in the UK. And they replied back with more details about the training they required, but they didn't answer the question about where they were. So we, got, we carried on, and we discussed the price of the job. And I kept saying, where are you? And it came back that they were at Bagram Air Base, Kabul, Afghanistan. Um, I replied, isn't transport a little bit difficult? And they replied, don't worry, we've got a C-45 plane that will just fly you in. Um, it'll be fine. I said, um, don't think I'm covered under the travel insurance. Don't worry, we'll cover you for that. I said, oh, OK, that sounds cool. You know, five days flying, in, dropping into a war zone. That should be interesting. So I was having a family meal with my parents, and my dad was saying, so how's this Jumalo thing going? He's never quite mastered after seven years, and it's called Joomla. No idea what he'd do if it was called Drupal. Um, and, um, you know, how's business? And I said, it's great. I said, I've got a new inquiry. He said, who for? I said, the US Army. He said, oh, that's good. He said, where is it? I said, Bagram Air Base, Kabul, Afghanistan. And my mother said, you're not going. So I said, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. So the next day, I went to see my girlfriend, and she said, how's work? I said, it's great. She said, have you got any more trips planned? I said, yeah, a few. I said, oh, where are you going? She said, well, Bagram Air Base, Kabul, Afghanistan. And she, I didn't know my girlfriend had handcuffs. Uh, but she was in, so suffice to say, I didn't go to Afghanistan, but that would have been quite fun. So um, as I said, I, although I'm the co-founder, um, I don't have the Joomla car. I don't have the Joomla jet. Um, I'm just a regular community member um, sitting here dreaming of the day when I can buy a Joomla beer. Now, before I came, Open Source Matters, which is the non-profit arm of the Joomla project, sent me an email. And they said, Brian, it's great that you've accepted the invitation by Drupal to go and speak at the Drupal conference. But please remember that you are representing Joomla. Yeah? So dress smart. So here I am in my suit, which I've not worn for about six months, and I have put on a little bit of weight, and it's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and I, I thought my tuxedo was going to be too much. Um, and as it's not a Joomla event, uh, my Elvis costume with my Joomla belt was definitely not going to be appropriate. Um, but I'm really... I, I was tempted to wear that, but I did see before I arrived that there's a Drupal code of conduct for the conference. So I thought the mankini's definitely out. Um, I was tempted to show the Joomla tattoo. But again, there's a code of conduct, so um, I'm not going to show that. Um, but I am pretty uncomfortable in this suit. So if you'll just excuse me, I'm going to get more into my geek mode. So now that I'm in geek mode, let me carry on. So there's a few things I'm not going to be speaking about in this presentation. I'm not going to mention Drupal. I'm not even going to mention Drees. It just says copyright as per the website's request. Um, I'm not going to mention Acquia, 
or any of the Drupal sponsors or companies. This presentation is just about Joomla. So if you're expecting something different, now is the time to leave. And I won't be offended, but Grace will take your name at the end. <laughs> so, so what is Joomla? First of all, at the simplest level, it's software that's going to help you build websites. Um, if you've never heard of it, just a few quick facts. Um, since the Joomla project started in about 2005, um, we've seen massive growth just of the web visitors. The stats start at 2006 because we were so disorganized in 2005, nobody thought to keep anything. And you can see we've grown from like a million uniques a month to 7.5 million uniques a month right now. Um, we have events all over the world. Um, we tend, typically in the Joomla world, we have local events rather than global events like DrupalCon, but I'll come back to that later. The main forum itself, where all the sort of support issues uh, take place, it's had 2.6 million posts over the last six years, not including the spammers. Yeah, we probably had another zero if we included the spammers. That's about 560,000 unique people posting over 1,000 posts a day. Um, but of course, that's not all of it, because those people, if they're not English language speakers, a lot of them operate their own local community forums and support sites, so we're not including that. The downloads, 33.5 million downloads right now. But again, that's only the official downloads from the official site. doesn't include any downloads that might come from the web platform installer or from a, uh, directly from a hosting system. So it's a lot. Um, we have an extensions directory. I guess the closest thing is, is the modules contrib in Drupal. We'd actually just hit 10,000 extensions. Um, unfortunately, the person who did the graphic didn't allow enough space for the extra digit, so I had to stick at 9,999. Um, in the Joomla world, extensions are slightly different to modules and things in the Drupal world. Um, a lot of them are full-blown applications like CRM, um, but there also might be 50 different modules that offer you to tell you what the weather is, uh, which is always the most useless module in the world. You know, what's, you know, do you really need a module that's going to tell you what the weather is? You know, what's wrong with looking out the window? Um, but I've got a client, a retail store, and I was doing my presentation, and I made that joke about the weather module being useless. And they went, wow, we can put a weather, something that says what the weather's like? I said, yes. I said, and it's going to say it's raining. I said, yeah, oh, we've got to have that. And I was like, why? So, well, we're a big retail store, and when the weather's raining, we need to make sure that the managers know it's raining and they can go from their little cubby hole in the back with no windows right the way to the front and put the umbrellas there for sale. So we've got a wide range of extensions. Um, Joomla is actually available in about 64 languages now. Um, I'm still going to keep using this 57 image because I like it. Um, it should have been 65. I've got a half-completed Klingon translation sitting on my laptop. Um, the reason why it's only half complete is because Klingon's great for the negatives. Access denied, delete, <laughs> no, at, forbidden. It's great for those things. It's absolutely useless for OK, yes, publish, for all the positives. But one day, I promise, I will finish it. Um, we've got about, according to the latest stats, about 2.9% of the top million websites in the world run Joomla. But actually, the numbers probably Wait, the percentage is much, much higher when we go down into the smaller website market. Um, in, some com in some countries, um, in, we've got over 50%. There's one country with 86% of all the websites in that country running Joomla. Um, they only have 300 websites, but we've got 86% of them. So I think there's two web developers. One's bigger than the other one, or it's faster. Um, there's about 3,000 different government sites um, in every country in the world and every territory in the world that run with Joomla. Even whole countries like Mongolia, where 95% of all the government's websites are all running on the Joomla system. And, of course, we've got users all across the world. Um, this map is showing the, the user groups. Um, the one on the far right that's in the, in the mid, sitting in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, uh, it's not a mistake, that's Fiji. Um, there should be, if I zoomed out, we could actually do a user group down here at the bottom uh, in, Antarctic, in Antarctica. There is a guy at one of the research stations on, near the South Pole 
who is a Joomla user and is building Joomla websites and publishes all his work. And can't really call it a user group. He's the only person within a 500-mile radius. So it would be a user group of one. Um, but most importantly, Joomla is all about the people. Um, just interestingly, I noticed here at DrupalCon, um, everybody is using their IRC nicks or their, um, as their name. In the Joomla world, we use real names. Yeah? Um, it so happens mine's the same, but you know, most people do use their real name. So who are Joomla? Yeah? Are we hippies? Are we pirates? Or are we revolutionaries? To understand that, we need to think a little bit, go a little bit further back to where Joomla began. It was not the usual web startup system. Yeah, it had a very unique beginning. It didn't begin in a bedroom. It began on the south coast of Australia in Melbourne. Yeah, I know that's a photo of Sydney, but there really are no iconic buildings of Melbourne. And it began with a, a piece of software, a simple CMS called Mambo Open Source, which was created by um, a small Melbourne company. That's Mambo Open Source, not Mambo Number no. 5 by Lou Vega, or even Mambo Number no. 5 by Bob the Builder, and definitely not Mambo the Surfer Dude Clothing Company. <laughs> so you see that again? So it began with this, uh, as I said, it was a, a software product uh, produced by a company called Miro, and they didn't really do anything with it. And in 2001, they put it on SourceForge, kind of dumped it there, said it was open source, in the hope that one, that one night the open source fairies would come along, find it, and fix all their problems. Well, that's kind of what happened. And by 2004, Mambo was winning awards. Yeah, um, all over the place, Linux world and CMS world and all sorts of stuff, Mambo was winning awards. But in 2005, <laughs> shit happened. Now, I don't really want to go too much into the details of exactly what happened, but enough to say it resulted in this, our Declaration of Independence. So on the 17th of August 2005, Andrew Eddy, who was the leader of the what we called the core team in those days, wrote our Declaration of Independence, where he said that the most important things for us were about producing free and open source software and contributing to that as a team. Yeah? And also, importantly, having fun while we were doing it. So we took the code, and we decided we were going to abandon our roots and carry on doing something else. Now, this is a picture of most of those people. Were we revolutionaries? I'm not sure. Um, were we pirates? Well, I don't see any peg legs, I don't see any parrots, and I don't see any eye patches. Uh, were we hippies? Well, there's no caftans or hooker pipes, but there are a few beards. Although they are quite feeble beards. Um, but maybe that just shows the, 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 the youth of the team. So 1st of September 2005, Joomla was born. And Joomla was a brand new word. Um, we invented it. It's based on a Swahili word which means all together. Uh, we just changed the spelling slightly. And at that point, there were four hits in Google. Today, Google says there's 426 million hits. I think really 426 million, that's the point when Google says enough already. You know, I'm not, do you really want me to count them all? Um, so it's a lot. It's a massive change from four to 426 million. And along the way, it's been a very exciting ride. Um, few incidents along the way, as you'd imagine, um, but most importantly, it's been a lot of fun. So one thing I'm always asked is, who is in charge of Joomla? Well, it's not me. Um, Joomla has no big boss. There's no dictator, not even a benevolent one. There's no secret group or secret circle or founders group who have got the final say, who can make a decision about whether some code goes in, or whether this is the direction we want. None of that exists in the Joomla project. And to be honest with you, there's not really a planned direction. Yeah, there's no one with the master vision that says, this is what's going to happen in three years' time. What happens will happen. So a little bit about the project structure.
The first thing we did when we founded the project um, on legal advice from the Software Freedom Law Center was created a nonprofit organization called Open Source Matters. And we created that so that we had some legal entity that could hold the domain name, the trademark, and the copyright. Because a group of individuals can't. There had to be some corporation that would do that. So it's registered in New York City as a not-for-profit organization. Um, and it's also there so that it can have a bank account and can accept money. Now, the money bit was, such a, was so low in our agenda because up until that point, the maximum we'd ever received in donations in a year was about $500. Yeah, so money was really not a priority, but the lawyers said we needed a bank account. So we got a bank account, the domain name, trademark, and copyright, and threw it all into Open Source Matters. Now, Open Source Matters is structured to be deliberately weak. So the members of Open Source Matters, and I'll come back to that a bit later, they really have no control over the project. Yeah? They are just there because you need legally to have people inside a company, and you need people to sign a check, and things like that. So that was it was deliberately structured to be weak, so that no one could take over the project, or change it, or sell it, or anything like that. Now, the actual leadership model in the project has evolved quite a lot over time. Some of those have worked and some well, and some of them have worked not so well. And we're constantly evolving that um, and trying different ways. So what are some of the styles that we've tried? Well, at the very beginning, we were just a very small team of about 16, 17 people, of which only about four were active. And that included everything from community management to code writing, uh, to forum support, to you know, uh, the horrible open so non-open source world of, word of marketing, um, and things like that. And this group kind of existed on a desert island all on their own, and they just did their own thing. The problem with that was it led to burnouts. Yeah, I know, um, speaking purely personally, at the time that we launched Joomla, I was probably doing about 40 hours a week, volunteer time just on Joomla, and there were others who were doing the same. So obviously, during that period of time, family life, gone. Social life, gone. Company life, yeah, that went as well. So there's only so long you can do that. So when that sort of failed and people were suffering from burnout, we switched to a more traditional pyramid structure. Yeah, don't really need to explain it. A few people at the top filters down to a larger group down the bottom. We got a bit too big for that, so we then split into two pyramids. Yeah, one side was looking after the community issues, and one side looking after the code issues. Yeah, we called them the community leadership team and the production leadership team. And that worked for a while. Um, the problem with the pyramid is it's very hard for a new person to rise to the top, no matter how good they are. And it's also very hard for someone to step down. Yeah, because you know, people's time that they can give, their lifestyles, everything, affects how much they can be involved. And that pyramid structure really doesn't help. So we move from a pyramid structure to circles. And we kind of have three circles now. We have the bigger circle, which is the community leadership team. We have the next size frying pan, which is the production leadership team. And then we have the small one, which is the open source matters, the nonprofit. And the size of those teams has gone up and gone down, and their roles have changed slightly. But fundamentally, we've got three teams. And they're loosely connected together, but not directly. Now we've got a situation where we've got lots of circles. We've got this could easily be the description of the community leadership team with a big circle, which is the main coordinators, and then we've got the guys who do the forums and the guys who do the magazine and the guys who look after this part and that part. So, but they're all sort of loosely connected circles. So that's pretty much where we're at right now. Have we solved the challenges of running a community-based, non-corporate, 100% volunteer-run system? No, we haven't. But what are the challenges that we faced? How have we addressed them? And are there some lessons that other people can learn from them, perhaps? The most crucial thing is that it's all about the people. 
you know, each group at different periods of time, you're going to have people who are good as leaders, you're going to have some great managers, and you've just got the rest of the community who might just be users. And what you can do and how much you can do is really going to depend on that group of people. So some of the challenges that we've had, one of the ones that personally I always struggle with is how much available time someone's got to contribute to the project. I can be sitting in a meeting and we divide the tasks up between people and let's say it's about five hours work each. Well, I might finish the meeting and I'll go and I'll work through my five hours and I'll send a message, I'm done. And the next day, someone else sends a message, I'm done. And three weeks later, we're still waiting for somebody else. And it's, well, I've only got five hours a month that I can actually contribute. So that's a, that's a big issue that we face. We've not solved it. Yeah? Um, we're just kind of aware of it. Um, those of us who work quickly just end up doing more. Um, if we're working as a team, it causes issues. Uh, it causes frustrations. Occasionally causes some arguments. And then we've got world time. Have you ever tried to organize something where you're working with someone in New York, London, and Australia? If you want to actually try and make a, a real-time meeting between people in those three places, it's almost impossible for somebody not to have to get out of bed. Yeah? There's only so many times you're going to be the person that's getting out of bed. Of course, living in the UK, I'm kind of in the middle, so it doesn't really affect me, but it does affect everybody else. Um, so that's kind of, that has been a big issue in the past. And the other issue on time is cultural time. When I say I will do something tomorrow, being British, I mean I will do it the day after today. When someone from South America says I'll do it manana, and I go to Google Translate and it says tomorrow, it just means not today. <laughs> um, this Greek, which I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce, just means later. And later really just sort of means any time in the next week or month or, you know, if you're lucky. Um, it could be a lot longer. So it's just some, some of the issues that we've got to be aware of when we're working in a group that when someone says one thing, they don't necessarily mean what you think they, they mean. Now, paid development is a, a nasty word in the Joomla community. Um, we did try um, to pay a couple of people um, as developers in exactly the same way if you know about the Debian project and their dump team experiment a few years ago. There was an impasse. There was a feeling that if we need to break that barrier, we had to pay these couple of people just to work on that one little bit. And then when that was done, everything else was going to flow into place. Well, apart from the fact that that didn't happen, the worst thing about it was that everybody else was screaming, why aren't you paying me? Is my work not as good? Is my work not important? And so that caused a lot of issues. So we tried it. It failed. And we will never try again to pay developers to work directly on the project. Now, you may have gathered from my accent that, and I, that I speak the Queen's English. And the Joomla project itself, the official language of the, of the Joomla project, is en-gb. If you install Joomla, that is the default language. And all the spellings are British spellings. So it says color with a U. Um, there's no extra Zs anywhere. Um, it's all in the Queen's English. But like in the Drupal project, most communications that take place within the project just take place in English. What is English? Or is it American? You know, are they the same thing? If anybody speaks Welsh, uh, does anybody speak Welsh in the room? Okay, so I, can I only need to give a rough translation. That says, I'm sorry, I'm not in the office right now. Please contact me later. And you can see here, again, another one where automated translation has failed. You can never tell when you're in an online meeting with someone and they're writing, are they a native English speaker? Is English their second language, their third language? Their even their fourth or fifth, or even the, are they just relying on Google or Bing Translate to do the translations? And no matter how good someone's English is, if the English is not your first language, and I mean the Queen's English, if the Queen's English is not your first language, it's going to cause problems. Lolcats. This is not one of those slides that every geeky presenter likes to put in about cats. 
I'm talking about pussycats. Actually, more specifically, I'm talking about the word pussy. Now, in British English, somebody said on a mailing list, I am not going to be a pussy and I'm going to do the work myself. Yeah? And that's a perfectly normal statement and it just means, you know, I'm not going to be weak or timid and expect somebody else to do it. I'll, I'll do it. Now, this took place, this post on a mailing list took place US time, not European time. By the time I woke up, there were about 300 posts in a group that only had about 20 members. <laughs> and it, not, it was not, not of the usual posts, you know, the plus one and the smile and stuff. These were big posts. And after an hour of reading it, I discovered that in America, using the word pussy has a different meaning. And so these American people had jumped down the, the throat of this poor Slovenian developer who'd found a bug and was offering to fix it. Um, so we've got to be really careful about the difference between British English and American. Yeah? And it's constantly causing problems. I'm always aware myself when I'm talking to somebody that English is not always their first language. Um, but sadly, you forget every so often, and other people are just not that aware. And it can be really quite fun watching someone whose English is their third language trying to explain an issue to someone else who also doesn't speak English as their first language. And then they both discover that actually Spanish is their first language. And if they spoke to each other in their own language, it would get solved much quicker. Um, so we, we do have issues with that. So there are language barriers. There's language barriers that prevent people getting into a project because they don't have a command of English to understand the guidelines. Uh, one thing we're trying to work on, and actually people have been trying to work on it for about a year or so, is you can't even sign up to go to a to join a site because the sign up's all in English, and if you don't understand those fields, that's also difficult. Should be easy for us to solve. It's not quite been solved yet. So there are language barriers, but with a bit of work, we can overcome them. You just have to be aware of those issues. And of course, there's cultural differences. I personally like my tea with milk. Some people prefer it with lemon, or with mint, or even rose petals. And of course, the geeks in the room will just take their cold cup of coffee, put it in the micro microwave, and nuke it. So there are cultural differences. Let's have a closer look at one of the cultural differences that we found in the Joomla project. One world, many cultures. That's that user group map again. Let me just zoom in on the Netherlands, not too far from here. So Netherlands, it's a small country, and they've got about 14 user groups that meet on a monthly basis. Let's have a look at Italy, slightly larger country. They have no user groups. From that, can we conclude that there are no Joomla users in Italy? Well, actually, no, because almost every city in Italy uses Joomla for its official website. There's about 900 sites just for local authority and government. So Joomla's huge in Italy, but no user groups. And in fact, it's so big, when they have a Joomla community day, they get 1,200 people attending. In the Netherlands, they get about 200. So you have to work on local models not global models. That's one thing we've learned. You can't take something that works perfectly in Boston and, and take that as a model, as a plan, and say, here you are, Copenhagen. This is how to do it. Because you can try. You might be lucky. But as a general rule, you've got to adapt to the local culture, the local needs. Now, something we also try to do is on the, on the teams that we have, we try to ensure that they're distributed throughout where Joomla is most active. So Open Source Matters, which is the nonprofit arm, as mentioned earlier, currently has 12 members. Um, there are three in the USA, one Central America, one South America, one South Africa, one in uh, East Asia, one in the Middle East, and four in Europe. If we look at their distribution by gender, we can see that currently there are three women on that list and nine men. And it's been a little bit higher in the past. I think at one point it was 50-50. Um, it's dropped down a little bit right now. And then if we look at what is their native language, 
only four of those, three in the US and one, surprisingly, in France, have English as their native language. For everybody else, it's their second or third language. This distribution of where people are, their gender and their language, their first language, is not by accident, it's by design. Yeah? When creating the Open Source Matters team, people have are selected might be the wrong word, but it's the closest one I can think of. Um, their country, their gender, their language is taken into account so that we can try to ensure as balanced a group as we can possibly get. Yeah, it's not going to be 100% statistically accurate, accurate to represent um, the situation, but it's as close as we can get. And that's something that, that the project is always conscious of um, when one person lead, leaves a team and they're looking for someone to replace that person, where they are, what gender they are, what language they speak, is part of the decision process. Yeah, not just are they good enough to do the task. So I've got a secret coming. I'd like to ask you please not to share it. It's the Joomla business plan. Uh, for those of you who um, can't keep a secret, can you just cover up your eyes and block your ears? Um, so what is the Joomla business plan? Well, this is it. Joomla doesn't have a business plan. Joomla has no intention of ever becoming a hosting company. Joomla has no intention of becoming a training company. Yeah? Joomla has no intention of creating a consultancy company or a website building company. That's not what the Joomla project's about. Yeah? The Joomla project itself is a complete ecosystem yeah? where everybody is able to participate to the level that they want without fear that the project itself is ever going to compete with them because that's not what the Joomla project's about. There is no business plan. So it may seem confusing, but really it is all very simple. Joomla itself is a big ship. And inside that big cruise ship, there is, really is something there for everyone. Now, of course, with every ship, it's not always easy sailing. Um, but, you know what, at the end of the day, it seems to work. We have fun. Sometimes there's even a few beers. Um, not as many as it seems to be in the Drupal community, but we, you know, we have a few beers. Um, so it's not even about the leadership, because that fluctuates. It varies. People come, people go. It's about everybody working together to help each other, whether that's helping a friend, telling a friend, teaching a friend. But for me, perhaps the most important thing about the Joomla project is making friends. And they, people contribute and share and help each other in many different ways, whether that's working on translations or tutorials, designs. And occasionally, someone actually might write some code. Um, please don't check the code on that screenshot. It's not Joomla code. It's from a stock image. Um, so I have no idea what it's going to do, but it definitely doesn't look like Joomla code. It's all about the people. That's the fundamental part of the Joomla project, is that the people come first, and what the people are doing, and what they want to do, and what they're trying to do, is the overriding thing. So I've not quite finished. It's not about who is bigger. It's not even about who is better. The most important thing for people, for people in the Joomla community and the Drupal community is that almost 75% of the top million websites are not using an open source CMS at all. That's what matters. Yeah? That's where our market, that's where our user bases can grow, that's where our communities can work, that's where the businesses can interact. Not in competing again, which is better, Joomla or Drupal or WordPress or any of the other open source systems. The important thing is that, that almost 75% of the top, the top, white, top sites are not even on open source anything, never mind the CMS. Joomla is not the enemy. We are all open source together. Um, I'd like to extend the invitation that the Drupal community made to me, inviting me to take part here this week, um, to everybody else. 
Um, Jung was having its first ever world conference um, in San Jose, California at the eBay Town Hall, 16th to 18th of November. Um, everybody is welcome. Yeah, we are a friendly bunch. Uh, no one will be left sitting on their own in a corner uh, wondering who to speak to. Um, no one will have a Drupal t-shirt ripped off their back. I mean, it's, you know, we're, we are, we're a nice bunch. Um, so, you know, every, you know, everybody is welcome. It's the first time we've really done a world conference. Because as I said, we've always concentrated on local events. Yeah? So it's going to be an interesting experiment for us. Um, at this point, normally at a Joomla event, I say no questions. You're not allowed. The only way you can ask me a question is by giving me a coffee or a beer. Um, but I've had too much beer already. And if I have any more coffee, I'm going to be in the bathroom the whole time. Um, we've got some time. So if anybody's got any questions, fire away. So um, thank you very much to the Drupal community for inviting me to speak and to share my thoughts about the Joomla community. Thank you very much.